Our first reading is from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that, he, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And from the Gospel of Mark, reading in chapter 13, but be alert, I have already told you everything. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be aware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch, therefore keep awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or at cockcrow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The hottest ticket on Broadway for the past year, year and a half, is the hit musical Hamilton. Lin-Manuel Miranda created something unseen before. Based on a biography of Alexander Hamilton by Ron Chernow, it is the story of Alexander Hamilton, one of our nation's founding fathers, though until this musical, arguably one whose story has been far less known. It is an innovative, inventive, modern theatrical production that breaks boundaries in its creative, diverse casting in unexpected musical styling. Our family loves it. No, we haven't seen it. <laughs> we love the music and we listen to it often, all the time. But it's more than that. Our children enjoy history a great deal, and the story is quite compelling. Interestingly, Hamilton's story 
like most people's, includes a number of key characters, people who figure prominently throughout his life. One of them, and this is the part of our nation's early history that you may know, is Aaron Burr, the man who ended Hamilton's life in a duel. Burr actually serves as the narrator of the musical. So he looms large as a featured singer throughout the work. A main theme that runs throughout the story is the tension between Hamilton and Burr during their lives. See, Hamilton is an incredibly intelligent, gifted writer extremely hardworking immigrant with basically nothing who comes to New York City and goes after everything without reservation in an effort to further himself and his station. He is ambitious with a capital A and he is direct about that with whomever he encounters. Burr on the other hand, comes from a prominent family. He is bright, interested in furthering himself too, but he is quite political about it. He chooses to hold back, not letting folks know exactly where he stands, mystifying some, annoying the heck out of others. So, these two rather different individuals encounter and interact with each other, and it is the attitude and disposition of Burr that is highlighted particularly in contrast to Hamilton in one of the show's songs. Now, this happens to be my like favorite song of the show, and I want you to listen to a portion of it as Burr sings now. She's mine. Love doesn't discriminate. And the sinners and the saints. It takes, it takes, it takes. If you keep loving and wait, you laugh and cry and pray. You make mistakes, set and fail. Your reason come by the side. So many you try. And I'm willing to wait for. I'm willing to wait for, wait for, wait for. My grandfather was a fire and brimstone preacher. preacher, preacher, preacher. But there are things that the see to protect death doesn't discriminate and the sinners and the saints it takes it takes it takes if you keep living anyway you rise and fall and break and you make mistakes and you fail the reason i'm still alive when everyone who loves me has died i'm willing to wait for wait for i'm willing to wait for Wait for it. If Burr's life has a slogan or mantra, that's it. Wait for it. And he's emphatic here. This is not a small thing to Burr. And here's why. First, you might be asking, wait for what? Well, the answer is pretty clear. 
For Burr, it is whatever is good and right and just for you and your life. See, remember, Burr comes from not only a prominent family, but one of strong religious convictions. Did you hear the line, my grandfather was a fire and a brimstone preacher? His grandfather was Jonathan Edwards. That is historically accurate, okay? You know, Jonathan Edwards, famous Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. You don't get more convicted about God's grace and justice and mercy and judgment than that. Burr himself studied religion before he switched to law and completed law school. And secondly, there is important theology here. The chorus, love doesn't discriminate. It takes and it takes and it takes. We laugh and we cry and we break. We make our mistakes. And then again, the second time the chorus, death doesn't discriminate. It takes and it takes. We rise and we fall. We make our mistakes. And if there's a reason I'm still alive when everyone who loves me has died, then I'm willing to wait for it. As reformed believers, we accept that very theology, that God loves us and grants us opportunities for love and life and laughter, but also sadness and death. None of us, not a single one of us, has all joy and nor only sorrow. And for Burr, he resolutely believes that because that's how life goes, holding back, waiting for what will unfold, not passively without making choices and decisions, but not going whole hog either, rushing into things, being rash or hasty without deliberate action or intention. For him, that is how life is best lived. That's what he's singing about here, to wait for it, for what God reveals and lays out before one in his or her life is the proper way for moving forward, ahead in life, for finding one's way, for being intentional and living out one's purpose. And that, friends, is particularly informative and illustrative for us this day. Why? Because today is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent is all about waiting. Waiting for four weeks, a whole month, to get to the story of Jesus' birth. Have you all thought about that? Maybe you haven't all that much. We go from Thanksgiving and boom to Christmas, right? I get it. Advent sort of gets swallowed up. But if you are thinking about it right now, I imagine some of you might find it troubling, or strange at least. I mean, what is all this waiting about? Why do we wait to sing our joy to the world? After all, we know it's coming. How come we don't jump straight to the manger, the angels, the sages bringing their presents? What does this time do for us? Now, that question might be prompting you to say, well, Donna, that's not really the question. What does this time do for us? Perhaps it's more about what we're supposed to do for others, or perhaps it's less about us and more about God. Indeed, I'll give you that. And I imagine Reverend Carrasco will be talking about those things quite a bit when she returns. But for today, the question is still before us, what does such waiting do for us? Or maybe we should ask it this way. What does this time of waiting allow for us? What if we wait for it? Well, if we listen closely to the words from Mark, We hear about the glorious event, the coming of the Lord. And if we really listen, we find out that this glorious event is about something more than the birth of Jesus. That's right. This waiting time of Advent 
waiting for the coming of the Lord actually means two things. See, the first meaning remembers the coming of Christ in history when there in Bethlehem, in a manger, in a stable, came the baby Jesus. We celebrate Jesus' birthday, just like all of us have birthdays. That one's easy to understand. We get that. But the second meaning, that is the time when he shall come again, a future history in which Christ shall return. What will happen then? What does Mark say? The powers in the heavens will be shaken. And the sun will come in great power and glory. Heaven and earth will pass away. The world as we know it will change forever as Jesus comes to judge between nations. This too is what we wait for. And as Mark directs, we must keep awake. That is, we better look lively. Why? Because we don't know when it's going to happen. We best be ready. We don't want to miss it because we failed to pay attention, proverbially fell asleep, that is, meaning we decided our needs and wants deserved first place over and above God's will and purpose for our lives. Perhaps what the waiting time of Advent offers us is an opportunity to become intentional in the waiting, intentional living like Aaron Burr, right? Wait for it. The belief that God is up to something, something good and right and just for our lives and the whole world that requires, even demands, our paying attention. Recognizing that waiting is not apathetic and listless in nature, suggesting we have no control over what happens. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Instead, it is a biding of time that is intentional. Our intention then means what? What does it look like to take some time to reflect on these meanings of this waiting? What God has already done in history, yes, that of sending Jesus into the world, and what God shall do when Jesus comes again. Are you ready to meet Jesus again? Are you ready to face God? As God determines, it makes me a little nervous, really, to think seriously about what God might say when greeting me. Do any of you feel that way? I wonder, have I done what God wills in my life? And if I haven't, how am I supposed to fix it? That's a little bit nerve-producing, right? It is for me. And that's just thinking about it from an individual perspective. Let's consider being intentional as a community. Are we following God's will, working together, striving for justice, showing mercy to others? Maybe, at least in some ways. But how are we doing as a wider faithful community of, of faith, as a church? Perhaps, both individually and as a community, what all of us can do in these weeks of Advent waiting is to think about this coming of God in the fullness of time and see that God was up to something more. Yes, more than the birth of a child. As great as that indeed is, and it is great, but here's what God was up to. In that act of sending Jesus, the baby, into the world, God turns the world upside down, offering a transformation beyond all transformations, bringing salvation and redemption not to one, not to a few, not to the people here at King's Grant, right? Yes to you, but not just to you. Not to a single nation or a region of nations, but entirely to all of humanity. Wow! And as God graciously offers that to each of us, we can think about what we're doing while we wait. Do we seek to follow the example of Christ? Do we expect God to change the world as promised in passages like that in Mark today? Do we really think it's possible? Do we truly believe 
that if we're intentional in our waiting, we might just see the miracle of God's entering the world, Christ coming to the world again. Advent gives us time to ponder such questions, to seriously consider if all that we do follows from an attitude turned towards God, a desire to live as God intends and wills for each one of us. It gives us that time. That's what we can find when we wait for it. There's value in this time indeed, and that is the point. As Advent progresses, as we wait and we approach the celebration of God's coming in the human form of a baby, born in a humble manger, let us remember that God's season of coming is also about the time when that child shall come again. Then and only then, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the world will no longer exist as we know it. It shall pass away and a new order will emerge. An order without war and strife. An order without millions of refugees. An order without pain. Without struggle without racial and gender and ethnic and ageist and every other kind of prejudice there is, without hunger and thirst and lack of basic necessities for living. It's hard to conceive of such a world where plenty abounds for all and peace is not just a hope but a reality. It's hard. But though hard, that is what we're called to believe. As Mark puts it, having faith requires that we keep awake. For doing so shows our trust in what God has done and is yet to do in sending Christ into the world. That is the very promise that attends God's final coming. Happy Advent. Mary waiting. As we wait for it, may we be intentional, alert, in tune to God's purposes and will for each and every one of us. May that be our disposition in these weeks of coming, heading toward the celebration of God's entrance into the world that turn the world upside down. And to the one who makes it all so, be honor, glory, power, praise, dominion, this day and always. Amen. going to take our lives to God in prayer, I encourage you to remember the people in this community who need our prayers, the people in the world, the places in the world that need our prayers.